What don't they tell fathers about raising sons? Well, raising children is harder than ever. Raising a boy to be a man? Dad, now that is a challenge we can not fail at. Here are six lessons I was never told when I was raising a son and how I'm working to raise two boys to be men. Let's jump straight into it. The first, he watches what I do far more than what I say. You know, I was pretty reserved and I remain pretty reserved as a person now, even when I was growing up and more so than ever. Um, and I don't really like to share my feelings. I don't really like to open up to my wife. It's just kind of the way that I was raised, the way that I was. And that really comes from my upbringing and my professional life as a firefighter, as a paramedic, when I was growing up and really doing things about five to 10 years ago. As a medic, you have to be extremely calm, confident, and cohesive when you are managing a very chaotic incident. So if there's a cardiac arrest that I'm managing, I have to walk into that scene of complete and utter chaos with family screaming, with children screaming, and be the one that's in charge and lead everybody that's around me to be able to facilitate bringing that incident under control. Having that type of mindset under some of the most strenuous situations you can have, you can imagine, at least for me, kind of turned me into a bit more of a stone-like person. So taking that mindset and shifting into being kid mode was a bit of a challenge for me personally. My wife especially has always said I don't open up, I don't provide my feelings, and she's very concerned now that my kids are seeing that and they too are not opening up and providing some of what they feel, what they need, some of the challenges that they're facing. And I'm starting to see that too. I'm seeing myself reflected back as my kids are interacting and trying to pass along the challenges that they're facing. And it's definitely a problem for me and it's something that I'm really working on. So that's not the best approach. Um, and there's a fine line between being cool, calm, and collected and completely disconnected. If that's something that you find yourself doing is you wall off your feelings, your approach, your concerns, your challenges, and you just deal with them and internalize them like most of us guys do, your kids are gonna see that. They're going to internalize that and then they are going to in turn reciprocate that out. In a day and age where we sit today, that can be a challenge because there's gonna be a lot of challenges and things that your kids, your boys especially, are going to be seeing on TV, on social media, if you're letting them be on social media, more on that later, and things just around them that they might have questions on, things that you didn't have to question when you were a kid. That's a challenge, that's a heck of a concern for me, and if they don't feel comfortable talking to you in a one-on-one -on -one format, you may lose them to whatever predations of the things that are sucking their minds out over here. So that's one thing that I'm absolutely working on is how I can show my feelings a little bit more. It's really difficult for me to do, but I think it's gonna be beneficial once I'm a little bit better at it and showing that so that my kiddos, my boys eight and three, excuse me, eight and six, can um, be able to show themselves. The other component to that is they watch the way that I treat my wife extremely closely. So if I'm snippy to my wife, if it's a, been a really long day and she's snippy to me and then I snip back or we have arguments, that's gonna be an absolute challenge when my kids, especially my boys, watch me and how I interact with her. Every time I do something that they see and they think, oh gosh, that's how you treat a woman, they're gonna internalize that and they're gonna move forward and they're going to think about that when they are interacting with girls on the playground or with their future wife. So it's such a huge point and this is something that I'm still working on extremely today how can I treat my wife better and when, absolutely, when I mess up, when I snip at her, when I have those challenges, I publicly, in front of the kids, apologize to her once we simmer down so that they can see this is what I did wrong and I apologize for it and we're moving forward. And then after the fact, typically when I'm putting the boys to bed, I bring it up again and I am completely honest with them. Boys, listen, what I did to mommy today was not the right way to go about it. I should have been better. I'm working to be better. And hopefully you won't judge me for that. So they will see that and the whole thing will go away. 
They will not judge you moving forward and you can start tomorrow anew. So something to absolutely keep in mind. Number two, they are selfish, sociopathic little sinners, especially your little boys. Your boys have grown up wanting to get the things that they want and they have never known anything else. So every day it's going to be your job to guide them in a moral path and a moral light so that you can help to push them forward so they don't, they don't continue to be those little sinners that they are. So think about it, your son has no clue, nor does he care what life was like before you and I were born. They think that they came into this world and dad was here only to be there to serve you directly. He knows that mom and dad have only been here to serve him hand and foot. Everything that he wants, he gets, and that can be really you know, invigorating. It can feel like those kids deserve every single little thing that they get, and it's such a challenge. We need to work to break them of that by one, treating mom, like in step one, like the queen that she is. More importantly, treating mom the way that you treated her before she was mom, when she was your wife, when she was your girlfriend, when you sat down to propose to her on one knee. Treating her that way will mimic how you want your kids to treat other people in life. So that's first and foremost. And second, as your kids exhibit those signs and those symptoms of complete selfish activity, you need to work very diligently to break them of that, show them why being selfish is not the way to go, and show them that there are many ways to move forward so that they can be a better kid, they can share, they can interact, and they can engage in life. A lot of these things go by simply, as I said, just modeling the behavior. I do my best when possible. We were out at a restaurant just the other day, and oftentimes I feel myself being drawn into, I just wanna order some food, the kids are driving me crazy, I don't want to put on a happy face. And then when that happens, I try to check myself, and I try to model how I want my kids to act at a restaurant when I'm not there and they're a little bit older, right? So I ask the server's name, I address them by name, I smile, I look them in the eye, I make sure to have the kids do the order and have them thank that server. And then I try to be as friendly and as um, cordial and appreciative to the staff, the cooks, the servers, and everybody in that restaurant as possible so that I can show them that the world is not just about us and the food that's coming to us by somebody in the back that's making it. It's exhibiting those symptoms and those capabilities that all of those people bring to the table, have an appreciation for that, and helping to pass that along to the kiddos. So make sure that those little sinners are broken of that at every chance you get, and it's simply by modeling that behavior wherever you can. If you're a new dad and you're starting to come into this and you're thinking, gosh, this is a lot to look at, this is a lot to learn, this is great information, but I want to get some more information just to survive the first two months, of my new baby coming, especially if I've got a boy coming. I've got a great resource for you. It's in the description below. It's a free survival guide for the first two months of you having your baby. All the things you need to know to be able to survive and thrive and help your wife when that baby comes. Check that link out in the description below. Totally free and uh, appreciate it. Number three, they may not like a sport. Now, I know if you're like me, you probably played a sport when you were growing up. For me personally, my parents had me basically do every kind of sport. I swam for a number of summers on swim team and that was absolutely horrible. Waking up at 5 a.m. every single morning to go swimming, I would never wish that on my worst enemy. Didn't do well at that. I tried soccer, I did a lot of soccer, but then I landed on lacrosse. Here in the Colorado area, we didn't have lacrosse when I was in high school until really early on and then we started to kind of bring lacrosse about. So I have these fond memories of us starting lacrosse um, seasons and bringing teams in here in Colorado in the late 90s, early 2000s. That was such a fun opportunity and I really love lacrosse. The challenge is my oldest boy, Bromley, he doesn't like lacrosse at all. He has no interest in it whatsoever. He likes baseball. I don't know the first thing about baseball, let alone coaching, let alone playing baseball. So he's basically on his own with this. And what I've come to realize is your kids are going to like sports that you don't like. You just kind of have to go along with that and they're not going to be little mini me's or mini you's. They're going to have their own interests, their own appreciation for things they want to do. So sometimes you just have to embrace it and let them do it. 
on that same note, probably don't put them into a multitude of different things because then you're just going to draw them away from some of the focus and some of the things, especially on schooling, which we'll talk about here shortly, that they also need to focus on. So if your kid is back to back to back to back with activities, they're not gonna get the time with you directly that you should have with them. They're going to be with the coaches, with the teachers, and with all the other things that are going on out there in the environment. I believe firmly they should be with you. They should be focused on learning from you as the dad and doing that one sport, try another one, do another sport, try another one. Make sure they finish the sport though. If they get through half the season, they say, I don't wanna do this, by making them finish out that sport or that season or whatever it is that shows that you finish what you start, you have that wherewithal and you put in the effort and then you can make a decision, a conscious decision to move on. So expose them to those, get them in with some of those coaches, but remember you are the ultimate coach and you're gonna be the one that's helping to push them forward and through with all those different activities. So good things to think about. Number four, school is hard. And school is different than when you and I were in elementary school, middle school, high school, and even college. Things change and have changed so significantly in the schooling system. I'm gonna do an entire video about this, about what my preferences are and why I pulled my kids out of the public school system altogether. We'll get into that in a different video, but you're going to have to engage in the schooling process deliberately and in a dedicated fashion, and it's gonna to have to be a team effort with you and your wife. School starts a whole new level of stress. It's nice and easy when you're thinking about, well, gosh, when I was in kindergarten, it was easy. We took naps, we picked our nose, we painted, we played with blocks on the floor. That is no longer the case anymore. School is a massive effort, and in kindergarten in particular, they're expected to know how to read. They're expected to know math facts and figures, and they're expected to sit in their chair for depending on what you're in, a half day or an entire full day. There's no naps anymore. So something to really think about is, okay, how do we prep ourselves for school even before we're getting into that process? And if your wife is anything like mine, she will take on the majority of the logistics, the nitty gritty, the details of how to get your kids set up, get them in school, keeping track of all the details, thank her for that every moment of the day because there is so much to keep track of when you're talking about schooling itself, when to register, how to register, all of the different things that you need to do to get into that, you're gonna need to start thinking about what school your child goes to when they are two or three years old. It's absolutely crazy. I still don't understand why it's gotten this way, but it just is the reality of the world. So. As you know, most kinder kids, um, as I mentioned, are expected to know the math and the reading. Um, and it may seem like a long way off, but definitely get started with that. Um, and if you're the designated interpreter for your kid, what I mean by that is if your kid is talking to another adult or one of your friends, and your friend or the other adult has absolutely no idea what your kid has said, but you've learned how the speech um, different uh, ways of your kid are so you can interpret for your kid with that adult, that might be a little bit of a red flag. I know for two of our kids, we had to make the realization that he was not that great of um, articulating his speech. So we put him into speech therapy. It didn't take too long and they were able to change his capability to enunciate some of those words and get him right on the straight and narrow so that it doesn't come up as being an issue, especially for boys when they're early in on their school time. So if you're the interpreter for your kid, maybe getting them in for a free speech therapy assessment at your doctor, super easy to do, and that will alleviate some of the problems that are going down the road. Even if you're noticing at age two or three, one of the things that my wife and I absolutely did in particular is we would appreciate the cute little nuances that our kids would say when the words were completely um, not uh, legible or um, hearable to them, right? We thought it was cute, we let it go, and then those little habits stuck. And then when they got into school, the teachers would say, well, gosh, um, your kid isn't speaking very well, we need to get this fixed. So definitely something to think about to help get them into some speech therapy itself. If they have trouble reading, if they're having trouble kind of uh, picking out sounds of letters, a lot of those things are things that you may need to acknowledge and take a look at and see a little bit beforehand because if your boy in particular is having trouble picking up some of the reading, the speech, 
and some of those issues, um, there's a good chance that that could matriculate into school and they're gonna fall behind. They don't slow down for kids anymore. They rush and move straight forward on and on and on. So if your kid is a little bit behind, maybe has dyslexia or something like that, it might be good to get them a little bit of tutoring so that you can raise that bar for them in their head a little bit better so that they can perform better as well moving forward from that perspective. Um, so as we move forward with that, uh, it is incredibly tough for boys in particular in school. Um, you've probably heard it all along, right? And I don't think this has changed. Girls, for whatever reason, especially early on in school, they just absorb academics. They have the ability to sit for longer and they have the ability to listen better. Boys like you and me, we were all over the place, bouncing around. We wanted to be active and physical. And these kids are expected to sit in school and in a classroom for eight hours a day and listen. It's just not possible for kids these days. They need to have that activity. So it's gonna be a lot tougher. So that's why if you can facilitate that vigorous activity outside of school, really engaging with your kids and helping them, that will help to make them a little bit better students and keep up with the rest of the class as they are moving forward. You may be tempted to just let it ride, but um, when they don't read well in school, for me personally, when I was in school, I felt like I could just muscle through. Still today, I'm reading some of my notes right now and I don't feel comfortable reading out loud because I probably had and still have dyslexia, but I was able to muscle through, right? I was able to just make things work simply by virtue of the fact that I could just push through and people wouldn't notice. That doesn't happen anymore. There are so many little um, tests and flags and things that all these teachers see and find and look for. Your kid's gonna be caught and they are going to be either dropped because the teachers are moving forward um, or they're gonna struggle. So definitely something to definitely keep in mind. Final fair warning on all this school topic and we can dive deeper into this in another video. Leave a comment below if you want me to dive more into the schooling discussion itself. Your wife will internalize every single struggle that your boy goes through every single day when it comes to school. If they have a bad grade, if they're having a trouble on a spelling test, um, a lot of the challenge that they face, at least from my perspective, my wife internalizes that. She thinks of it as something that is her fault when of course it isn't, and she takes that and she runs with it. So support your wife as much as you can, listen when she has these concerns, and do what you can to help facilitate more activity and, and more um, work when it comes to that. So that is all about schooling. And we Number five, hug your kids. Hug your boys especially. Now my father was absolutely my hero. Um, from a very early age, he and I were partners in crime. Anytime we would uh, go off and um, decide, hey, let's um, put a new sound system into our house, um, or let's take the car off road um, when there's construction and let's drive around that, let's see what they're doing and let's climb on that tractor that's completely off limits. Things that my mom never had an interest in doing, my dad and I would do. He's my absolute hero. I'll put a video together talking about my dad. He passed away from cancer when my second boy was just born. It was a true tragedy for me and it hurts every single day to know that he's not watching my three kids grow up. But my father was absolutely amazing. Um, but he, he laid this foundation for me and there were some things that I think even from his perspective were a little bit lacking. We had these great times together, but there was no real affection. Um, he never hugged, um, we never wrestled, we never did any of those type of things. He was pretty hard around the edges from that perspective. And my first boy, my nine-year-old, absolutely picked that up. He's, he's not the type to want to hug too much or do anything like that. Um, and my, as I said, my dad laid that foundation for me, but I look back on that time with my dad and thinking, well, why wasn't there more affection? Um, I, I feel like I, really appreciated our relationship, but I think it could have been up even higher on this level had there been a more close-knit, affectionate relationship between he and I. So for that, I've gone ahead um, for, for my own reasons and I've doubled down on that. And I have shown affection, especially to my boys, every single day, 
that I can. And really where that starts for me is every time they come out in the morning to have breakfast, I walk by to all three of them, including my cute little girl who's three years old, and I give every one of them a kiss on the cheek. I give them a hug. I ask them how they slept. I ask them how their day has been. And anytime I can, I give them that affection so that they can know that dad, no matter what I do, absolutely loves me unconditionally and can have that appreciation for when those tough challenges, those tough discussions come up, they're all about jumping in and having those discussions. So I think that's really important from that perspective. And I also do my fair bit of roughhousing, playing around. Anytime I get, I'm throwing those kids up and down. My wife absolutely hates it when I work them up before bed, when I'm wrestling, when I'm picking them up and I'm body slamming them on those beds. Those type of things too are affectionate. So if, if you're not the one to maybe want to hug your kids, get in there and wrestle with them and, and, and get close to them. For, for whatever reason for me, it absolutely just um, provides me so much joy to know that I have that affectionate relationship with the kids. And I think that bond that we're building, especially with my boys, by having that affectionate relationship will go farther when we're having those more difficult conversations downstream. So. Hug your kids. Number six, six, don't let today's culture take hold. Here's another one that I absolutely plan to write an entire script on and have a video for us to talk about directly, but this world will take your son, it will grab him, and it will steer him toward a world of effeminence and wussification and it will allow them to not be a man who is willing to go to bat for his wife, to go to bat for his family, and to stick up for himself. Our world is changing so drastically, and I, for one, will not let that happen. They tell kids and boys especially, don't wrestle at school. Don't get out of your seat while you're in school. Sit for 10 hours a day. Don't raise your voice. Don't stick up for your brother. Boys can be girls and girls can be boys. All of these things are putting a very challenging sickness in our boys' heads and they will not be able to fulfill the roles in the future of our society that men need to perform. The only person that's gonna keep them from getting indoctrinated by some of those challenges is you. You need to jump in there and set that ground rule, set that stage, and help to facilitate that discussion with your kid at every chance that you can. You are the sole barrier between this world and your son's mind. Take that seriously. Don't be afraid to call it out directly. Um, I, was, I was one to think, you know, um, even four or five years ago, oh, that's just a phase, we'll let it pass, the things that they hear, I don't want to really raise the ire of people around me and I've really changed my tune on that. I want for my boys in particular to hear my values, to hear why I think religion is important in this world, following Jesus is important in this world, and why a male's role in this world is different from a female's role in this world. If you can understand those two and you fulfill that role, you will help to take our society forward so do this by monitoring their consumption of media. I do my best to really watch on my son's iPads what they're watching. If you have Netflix, there's a way to go in there and block all of the horrible content that is out there that is trying to suck your son's brain and suck their soul into another way of thinking. You can block all of those. I always monitor if I'm sending YouTube videos to my kid. I only send them videos that I approve and you can do that. You can share it with your kid and he is under explicit rules to never watch anything that I don't approve of. Absolutely no social media. My kids will not have social media until they are at least 18 years old. They're not gonna get a phone until they're at least 13 years old and no social media at all. TikTok, Twitter especially, X, all of those things are such a challenge. You definitely don't wanna get your kids exposed to that. Expose them to your values, take them out, play ball with them, play baseball with them if that's what they wanna do and focus on that. And when things come up, 
Um, I always try to say um, when we're listening to a podcast as an example and they go to the brain sucking part and I always tell the kids, hey, they're trying to suck your brain out. They're telling you this, they have an agenda. Here's why they're saying this and here's why I don't think that that is the way that it should go. It doesn't matter where you sit on this. If you're on the right, if you're on the left, you have values, pass those values along to your son and make sure that they have an appreciation for that so that they can grow up to be good men serving society and more importantly serving their wife and their future sons. So those are the six things that I wish I was told about raising sons before I had them. I hope this helps you out a little bit. What questions do you have? What things would you add to this? Put them in the comments below. If you have things that you wanna learn more about, ask the questions. If you wanna get more in touch, um, you can uh, get that guide down below as well. I hope you're doing well. Come back, we got lots of great content for you and me and our fellow peer dads who want to be better husbands, fathers, and do better for the world. I hope you're doing well. Check out the video that I've got posted right here. You'll be able to learn a lot more about some of the great things that I'm talking about. Give me a subscribe and I hope you come back. Have a good day, thanks.